Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, if you're joining us on Zoom, just look at the top of the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are, you should see a little button that says Q&A. Click on that, uh, type in your question, hit submit, and I'll get to those at the end of the session. If you're joining us on YouTube, just find the live chat function wherever it is on your screen, and uh, you can uh, leave me a chat comment or question over there, and I'll get to those at the end as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainers. Been in the training department. I'm starting on my 10th year now, uh, traveling around North America, helping Texan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. I had about 30 different Snap-on franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they service in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. And before that, it was eight years at Subaru, so worked at a dealership, and I guess over time became the uh, default dyad guy in the shop. So I uh, always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would come into my bay. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs. Been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is immobilizer systems operation. Now, I will start this off with a disclaimer. There's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about in here. There's uh, legal issues that can be had. So uh, do your due diligence, do your homework, and uh, make sure that you are reading up on what the manufacturer requires of you before you would go in and do any key programming or work on immobilizer systems in the vehicles. So we'll do an overview talk about generally how they work, look at a couple different examples of different vehicles and how they're set up. And then uh, we'll go through some live examples as well. So with that, let's talk about the very first vehicle immobilizer. And I thought this was kind of interesting uh, when I looked this up. So it was patented in 1919. And it is analog. So in a series of nine switches, you can see this over here, there's a switch panel and then there's the switches inside. Depending on how the switches are set, the electricity is either cut off uh, totally so the ignition system won't, won't work, or it shunts that electricity over to, the horn, to a horn and it's kind of like a, a, a uh, proto alarm if you want to think of it that way. So if somebody tries to start the vehicle, it'll cause the, the uh, horn to honk, so to say. Now, with this, it was a very active system. I guess the driver, at least, had to be active in this uh, system because they had to remember to arm it. And you can arm it in many different ways because uh, all it is is just switching circuits on and off. So you, there's multiple ways you could do it. So they had to remember what switches they turned in order to turn them back the right way in order for them to be able to start the vehicle. So it was kind of a, an early method, a crude method, but it worked. I don't know how many of them this, they sold or installed in vehicles, but hey, way back over 100 years ago, that was uh, that was a thing, and it was patented, like it says up there, April 8th, 1919. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little history lesson there. So we move on to modern times, and essentially, the different systems that are out there work pretty much on the same principle. There's some different types of encryption and, and maybe a, a different module controls it instead of instead of one of the other ones. Uh, but by and large, you will see that you're going to have the vehicle's powertrain control because it needs to be able to turn off the, the ignition signal or the fuel injector signal or the fuel pump and or um, you know and, and the starter signal, right? Uh, BCM oftentimes is involved in this system and that's a lot of times where you're going to program it just because it is a vehicle body type control it's not always the bcm though it could be another module and a mobilizer specific module something of that nature the instrument cluster is usually involved as well because there's generally uh, most vehicles there's going to be some sort of indicator on the dash to tell you the status of what's going on then we have the key itself which has a little chip inside little transponder chip, they call it. And that is a radio frequency. It's kind of like RFID. If you got one of those tap credit cards, it's along the same lines, the same idea. And the key component, in my mind, not huh, no pun intended there, 
but in the cylinder itself, there is a coil in there. So what happens is when I want to go start the car, the BCM or whatever module controls this will power up the coil in here. It's a very low energy coil, but it generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field in turn excites the chip inside the key, which then sends a signal to the coil that then sends a signal back to whatever the controlling module is. If the number that's coded to the key, because each key will have their own separate number. So if the number coded to the key matches the one that's stored in the control module, it'll allow it to start. Otherwise, it'll e either start and die immediately or it will uh, not start at all. Uh, it just depends on how the system's set up. I've seen a couple mention that uh, we'll give it a three second leeway just in case, you know, to give every time everything time to kind of correlate. Um, but you'll either run for a little bit or it won't run at all. And then uh, if it does work, then it's seamless and it's just it just starts and run. Uh, so it just kind of depends on how the different manufacturers set it up. And it, like I said, it's essentially the same thing as how it works. Even with the newer keyless ignitions, the push button start. Uh, there's multiple antennas inside the vehicle, the proximity an antennas, to allow that uh, the vehicle to know where the key is in in you know in the car or whether it's close to the car, which can come into play a little bit later. We'll talk about that. Um, but as far as how it functions, maybe it's hard coded to the key. Well, the older systems are, anyways. Some of the newer systems will use what they call a rolling code, where it'll change every time. Uh, there's other ones that use different forms of encryption. So this is by no means an exhaustive list of different ways that different manufacturers do things. Uh, some of them are fairly simplistic. Some of them are kind of off the wall, right? Um, so it, 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 you need, like I said at the beginning, you need to do your due diligence, research what the manufacturer's method is for the particular vehicle you're working on, because it might, could even be the same model year. Different models have different ways of doing things. So just make sure you do your research and read up on it. Kind of brings us back to what we were talking about last week. Information fixes cars, right? So here's an example of like an 09 Ford Explorer. So that was a fairly uh, simplistic system. Wasn't a lot going on there. Uh, we have the instrument cluster on Fords. It could be the instrument cluster, the body control module, the ECM who's in control, one of them. Uh, it'll tell you generally. Uh, but we have the instrument cluster here, which in this case is the controller on this vehicle. And then we have the passive anti-theft transceiver. So that's the pass transceiver that is on the column. So that is your key. Um, that's your key uh, coil. There's also uh, in here is a sun load sensor goes through there for some reason for the anti-theft. I, I guess it must uh, must flash the sun load in the sun load sensor or something because it does have an LED in it. Uh, the smart junction box for power, and then uh, this is the ignition switch itself. So it'll cut it'll cut out the ignition switch if it doesn't work. It also has a high speed can that attaches to it as well. So let's read through the procedure on what the manufacturer wants you to do. So ignition key, turn the key from off to the on position. From the scan tool, follow the on screen instructions to enter security access. And there's a separate article on that. Uh, ignition key code erase, and then turn the key off. Insert the first PATS key in the ignition lock cylinder. Turn the key to on for three seconds. Turn the key off. Remove the key. Insert the next key. So sometimes you can just do it in sequence. Other times you have to do it separately, you know, one at a time. Um, most manufacturers do require you use two, at least two keys programmed at any given time. Also. Quite often, um, the manufacturer will wipe all the keys when you go to do a programming session. Usually they'll tell you, but I'm sure there's some times where they don't. But just be sure that you have all the keys that you want to program with the vehicle at the time. Because if in the case that it wipes it out and there's still one sitting at home in the customer's drawer that they want to program, well, that key's not going to work with the car. <clears throat> so you need to make sure that you have all the keys that you need. Uh, it says, once we've done that, the vehicle should start with both keys. If it's desired to program additional keys, up to eight keys total, refer to key programming using two program keys. So you can kind of go down here. And uh, in this case, it says use the scan tool, go to body security pass functions, 
enter security access on a Ford. That is a 10 minute wait. So the procedure takes approximately 10 minutes to carry out. It's not really doing anything other than counting down and, and making it so you can't just get in there and force your way in and program keys is going to make you wait 10 minutes every time you start a session. <clears throat> and then uh, select the function and follow the on-screen instructions for the vehicle. So in the case of, if you have a snap-on scan tool, you will have spare key programming. If it already has some programmed, you should be able to uh, uh, put a spare in there. Otherwise, you have security access, which will give you a list of other functions. You just have to wait for 10 minutes. So anti-theft functions on this vehicle are controlled by the instrument cluster in this case. The Ford anti-theft systems are also referred to as PATS, which is passive anti-theft system. And security access will take 10 minutes. If you hit continue, it's going to go and do a 10-minute security delay. So you'll see a countdown here on the bottom right-hand corner. And it's going to go through and just give you a timer. When it's done, it'll come up with a menu. And then it'll allow you to program keys, what have you. So for Fords, that is going to be generally speaking around 2010 and older vehicles that that'll support in our software. Because when it gets to the newer stuff, the high security keys, there's other stuff we're going to talk about in a little bit that throws a little bit of a wrench in there. So in, the, in those systems, fairly easy other than have to wait for 10 minutes. Next one we'll talk about is our uh, tried and true 2016 Tahoe. <clears throat> in this case, the body control module is where you go. The instrument cluster is also involved because it has an antenna. In, uh, actually, the, the, the instrument cluster on this one, security indicator. All right, so security indicator is there. And then it has a separate immobilizer control module with the antenna in it as well. Uh, so this one, uh, it's a little bit different the way we program it. So adding a key. And uh, by the way, this is North America. Most of the stuff I'm talking about, because uh, over in Europe, it's going to be different. Uh, in Canada, sometimes it's going to be different as well. Uh, so just so you know, in this case, to initiate the procedure requires that one learned key be available. You can do a total of eight keys on this one as well. Procedure adds keys only, does not erase previously learned keys. So that's good to know. I don't have to worry about wiping out any previous keys. This is just an add-on. The keys to be learned must duplicate the mechanical cutout of the current key because I need to be able to turn the lock cylinder. So if it doesn't have the same key cut, I'm not going to turn the lock cylinder. So with the previously learned key, turn the ignition on, turn the ignition off and remove the key. Within 10 seconds of turning off the ignition, insert the key to be learned in the on run position. Keep it on on run for five seconds till the theft light turns off. The vehicle has now learned the key. So that is as long as you already have keys programmed. All keys lost to be a slightly different procedure. Step three can be repeated until a maximum of eight keys are learned, including two factory keys to the vehicle. Be sure to keep the other keys and transmitters at least 12 inches away from the ignition cylinder while learning. Uh, so verify each transmitter is operating properly. Remove the key from the ignition cylinder. Wait 30 seconds. Insert the key in the ignition cylinder and start the vehicle. That's how you're going to verify. So there's different ways of going about it. Uh, on this, you can do erase or program all key fobs on the tool. Program the next available slot. Or you can go, There's a, as we said, up to eight slots on the vehicle can go in. Uh, so also, this is only for a uh, specific RPO code so or anything that doesn't have the specific RPO code. So if it's a, not an ATH RPO code, um, you can go through and do this. Anything with the ATH RPO code, which I guess must be a different key system, uh, has to use SPS programming, which would be using GM programming and a J2534 box. This procedure will erase all key files from the module memory. Before starting, ensure all fobs are programmed to be present. So once again, it's going to wipe them out. Make sure you have all your keys with you. Place the vehicle in learn mode. Simultaneously press and hold the lock and unlock buttons and select the fob until it displays learn. Go through that. So there's our domestics. Let's go to an Asian vehicle. So we got a 2016 Accord. And as you can see, we're getting a little bit more complex. There's at least a little bit more stuff on the wiring diagram here. So this involves the ECM the instrument cluster, the immobilizer control module itself, also the uh, relays, the fuel injection relays, it controls that, and then the fuel pump as well, because it cuts off the fuel pump, cuts off the fuel injection uh, until it's authorized to start. So to add one new key, in this case, have a registered key, a new immobilizer key, and first the first password from the IN system. So that's uh, something we need. We need to have a password to get into this vehicle in this case, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
uh, connect to HDS, which would be the Honda tool. But if you have a scan tool that's capable of doing this, it would work as well. Turn the ignition switch on, uh, select no mobilizer setup, then add or delete keys and add one key. Form the registration according to the instructions on the screen. Notice how most manufacturers will say that too. Just follow the instructions on the screen just in case the procedure changes. Right? So just whatever the screen says, follow that. So make sure you read and you go slow enough. Um, when prompted by HDS, perform the keyless transmitter programming. Make sure the keyless transmitting operation works properly. And then we also have an all keys lost situation. So if there are no keys programmed in a vehicle or we don't have the keys, can't get the keys, the keys are gone, they lost, they got flushed down the toilet, whatever, um, you need to have all the keys and the immobilizer PCM code. More on that in a minute. Go in through the scan tool, go add and delete keys and all keys lost, form the registration according to the instructions, check if the engine can be started, uh, make sure, uh, and then perform the keyless transmitter programming after to make sure that works as well. So it's kind of like a fob key all in one. Then we get to a 2018 Challenger. In this case, we would be programming keys not in the immobilizer, not in the body control module, but those go in the radio frequency hub module. Uh, it also has an, uh, it does have a separate immobilizer control module and has multiple proximity antennas. So this is a fob, fobic they call it, so fob in key. Uh, so uh, multiple proximity antennas, so it knows where you are. It's like you can kind of keep it in your pocket, walk up to the door handle, and it knows the key is there, so it unlocks and opens it. So let's zoom in on this one a little bit. So we got power. Uh, we got the body control module. It just has one wire uh, for ignition uh, control. We go over here. We're going to have the uh, TCM, so that's part of it. Uh, clutch interlock switch. Powertrain control module, it's got a couple wires there for the clutch. And then keyless ignition mode module, which is at the ignition switch. So that is the, uh, that's going to be your, uh, at the ignition switch itself, coil. Then we have five passive en entry antennas. So this one's under the center of hat shelf. This one, number three, is in the center front of the luggage compartment. Antenna two is behind the right rear quarter. Then we also have the right front exterior door handle switch, so I can touch the handle and it opens. Uh, antenna one is behind the left rear quarter panel. Left front exterior door handle switch is the two door vehicle. So if I go on the driver's side, same thing. And then the antenna four is on the center console. And then we also have the remote start antenna. So if the vehicle is equipped with remote start, it'll go into that radio frequency hub and allow it to remote start that way. So in this case, fob with integrated key is what they call it. So a fobic. Programming may require the use of a personal identification number for the vehicle. So here we go again, need this PIN number. A diagnostic scan tool and the appropriate diagnostic information. Also be certain that the FOBIC and any replaced electronic modules are programmed in the proper sequence. And it actually gives you a sequence depending on what you replace. So if you replaced multiple module on this vehicle, um, it is going to have a table that will tell you, okay, you need to do this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one. All right, uh, and then Sentry Key Transponder Programming. Sentry Key Transponder of all files with integrated key units include with the vehicle are pre-programmed to work with the radio frequency hub module when it is shipped from the factory. Uh, the RFHM may be programmed to recognize up to a total of eight FOBIC units when programming the blank Sentry Key. The integrated valet key must be cut to match the door lock zone in the vehicle, which will be used. Once the additional or new key has been cut, it must be programmed to recognize it as a valid FOB. Uh, if we go down a little further, uh, Sentry Key Immobilizer System, or SKIs. So they've had a bunch of different uh, different acronyms for this. They had SCREAM and they had SKIM and a bunch of different acronyms, but it, it's all your key programming stuff. Um, following the radio frequency hub module replacement, SKIs initialization requires the use of a diagnostic scan tool. Initialization will also require you have access to the unique four-digit pin code that was assigned to the original radio frequency module. So the pin code must be used to enter the secured access mode of the RFHM. So now we're getting into more complicated situations where I need to get these numbers from the manufacturer. Uh, if powertrain control modules replace a vehicle equipped with this, the unique secret key data must be transferred from the radio frequency hub module to the new PCM. Uh, procedure also requires the use of diagnostic scan tool and you need four digit pin code to enter secure access mode. All right, so if I were to look on the scan tool though, 
Uh, we do have some options inside the uh, radio fre frequency module. Maybe CU information or race ignition phobics, program ignition phobics, radio frequency hub replace, and reset the ECU. So this one's looking for a pin code, like I said. So on this vehicle, on the Snap-on Scan tool, it will give you a dialog box. I couldn't show it on, on this screen capture, but there, there is a dialog box when you go in and it asks for the pin. So you just type in the pin. If the pin matches the vehicle, it'll allow you to do that. All right. So that brings us to SDRM. So SDRM is, I don't know, probably 10 years old, maybe something like that. And it's called um, Secure Data Release Model. All right. So Secure Data Release Model is from the manufacturers demanding that we need to have a secure way of disseminating this information to both the dealerships and the aftermarket, right? So key codes are proprietary information. This is from GM, right from GM's uh, TSBs on this. Key codes are proprietary information belonging to General Motors Company and to the vehicle owner. The access of the GM key code lookup application is the privilege intended for GM dealerships to have the ability to service local customers. Uh, let's see. Uh, not intended to provide key codes to local auto auctions or repossession companies. It's usually the information of the purposes could result in the suspension of individual or entire dealership key code access and or criminal or civil prosecution. Uh, so you need to have you need to make sure that uh, you have a lot of information from the customer before you go and program this as well. So valid picture ID, vehicle registration. Um, GM takes this agreement seriously. Each user must be certain the vehicle ownership and input through unique security ID or clicking on the I agree button, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of this, a lot of this in here is due to the uh, in the manufacturer at the um, uh, dealership level. Uh, but if I want to go and look up key codes on AC, AC Delco's website, users must have a valid vehicle security credential from the National Automotive Service Task Force (NASTF) access this information so you'll see a common thread here a lot of manufacturers in order to access the key code legally there's the there's the big statement there right so it, being able to access this information legally um you need to have it set up with an account with nastf and secure credentials you need to be registered as a vehicle security professional for these types of things. So for ignition key codes, radio unlock codes, immobilizer codes, et cetera. Subaru, same thing. So they even label it NASTF secure data release model. Uh, you need to have positive identification. There's a form you need to fill out, verify the ID, verify the customer has the authority to do it, get a signature, file the form, make sure you're in compliance with uh, all applicable laws. And uh, a mobile ve vehicle security professional doing work for a body shop, garage or dealership, may accept a legible photocopy of the picture ID in order to match it to the registration. Uh, cannot be a fax copy, et cetera. So there's a lot of different things. Um, another example, BMW, right? So I get asked, well, what about European cars? I saw, I saw Quinn asked about that real quick. So uh, BMW says, nope, you can't have it. We're not giving it to you. The BMW group does not provide key codes to locksmiths except for those located in the state of California. So if you live in California, I guess their laws are as such where they have to give it to you, but they say, nope, if you don't live in California, you're out of luck. And uh, Mercedes is pretty much the same way too. We don't really have, uh, they don't really have information for that as well. They really want you to have to go to them in order to do it. Now I do know there are other tools on the market. There are other ways to go about these things. But that's a very legally gray area, and we're not going to get into it. We're just going to talk about here's what the manufacturers want us to do to make sure we're doing the right thing, make sure we're doing it legally. You don't follow the don't follow the protocol. It's on you, not on me, because I'm telling you this is how you do it the right way, right? So you can go to the nastf.org, which is their website, and there's some videos you can watch about it too. Uh, the account with them is free. Uh, so you can actually go in and get information from them um, for free. Uh, and then SDRM credentials, uh, that is where you would have to actually go in and, and get your information for uh, the credentials there. Uh, Phil, I see you're commenting, but all the comments get answered at the end. So I know you asked the question, do I not reply to the comments? I definitely will. 
Uh, it's just I, kind of hard to do two things at once, right? So uh, I will make sure I get to your answer. Uh, let's see, vehicle security professional. So on this page, the NASTF Vehicle Security Professional Registry is a service created from the NASTF Secure Data Release Model, a project of the NASTF Vehicle Security Team. It's a data exchange system conceived and designed cooperatively by automakers, the independent repair, insurance, and law enforcement community. It allows the aftermarket to access security sensitive information related to automobiles, for example, key codes, pin numbers, immobilizer reset information, and similar types of information. The VSP registry program allows access to security related information while protecting the safety and security of consumers and the integrity of autom automobile security systems. USA and Canadian locksmiths and automotive technicians qualified in vehicle security system repairs can become credentialed by the NASTF VSP registry in order to purchase security codes and VIN specific computer files directly from the OEM and automaker. The cost is a non-refundable $100 background investigation and $325 for a two-year credential. US VSPs can add employees as subordinate accounts at $100 non-refundable background investigation and $125 for a two-year credential. So the shops would be this for any employees they want to have do it at this. Businesses that have multiple accounts can request a no-charge administrative account that can be used to assist with documentation and account management, but does not have access to security information. Most automakers and OEMs make key code and immobilizer information available instantly from their websites 24-7-365, and we'll look more about that in a minute. All right, so here's an example screen. This is right off of uh, NASTS website as well. What states require locksmiths to be registered and licensed? Um, so if a VSP's operation crosses state lines, they also must properly be registered in all states. If a locksmith, a vehicle security professional must be registered and licensed as a locksmith if required. So uh, you can see the different states. And then also in Miami-Dade County, they're pretty strict when it comes to automotive aftermarket stuff. Uh, so all of these cities in Miami-Dade County, and then also Hillsborough County in one of the Virginias, I think, right? Yeah, Virginia. No, Florida. Never mind. Florida, Hillsborough County. Also, we have come to discover, anyways, uh, this was a little bit of an issue early on with the uh, pastor assistant. So if you want to do certain replacements, certain things uh, with the, um, with the um, different secured systems. So if I have to program, even sometimes flashing an ECM or other modules on the vehicle, you still need secure access to it. Uh, so we worked with NASTF in order to make it so there was a separate uh, kind of a, uh, so it allows you to monitor the vehicle and work on the vehicle while someone else does the programming who's registered. Uh, so they call it assisted immobilizer reprogram. So it's a group of NASTF vetted service providers that are available to help complete repair operations that require immobilizer initialization and can only be performed by a vehicle security professional. It's a paid service. If you choose to apply in your uh, to be the tech in your facility, you'll be asked to submit a few pieces of information to confirm your employment and facility location. They'll also perform a background check to ensure there's no criminal history that would be caused for denial of access. Uh, if you choose to pre-register, they'll try to get it done within 48 hours. If you choose to register at the time you're submitting a request, uh, we'll do the best to complete it within one hour. Of course, that would be also during operational hours for that. All right, so we're going to go through this website a little bit more uh, in a minute. So just, just so you can see, you know, kind of how you would go and where you plug things in. So some key points to remember to kind of sum this all up before we go live is you want to read and follow the manufacturer's programming procedure first. Follow it to a T. If it says to leave it on for five seconds, don't leave it on for three seconds or it's not going to work. Uh, many systems delete existing keys. So have all the keys that you want to program on hand because you have to do it all in one session. Have your LSID information ready if it's that type of vehicle that requires that type of information. You may need to retrieve a key code. And some vehicles and manufacturers also require a vehicle pin or access code to get into those vehicles as well. So it's not just as easy as, remember back in the day with the GM, it's the 30 minute key learn. You turn it on for 10 minutes, you turn it off, put the new one in, turn it off and it says like a 30 minute key learn. Ford's got that 10 minute thing. Newer vehicles, it's a little more difficult. So to do it right anyways, let's put it that way. So let me open a new browser. 
Okay, we'll pull this down here. And so we'll go to nastf.org. So it's the website, pretty simple, like I said. Um, I myself don't have a credential, so I can't log in there, but I can log in over here and we can get plenty of information from that. So let me just log in real quick. And uh, there are all sorts of resources over here. So this is the assisted immobilizer reprogram we talked about. Uh, there's more information over here. It talks about it as well. Uh, let's see. Vehicle security professional. So we looked at this page before, but there's a bunch of links down here as well. So if you want to join, you can go in there. If you want to get ready to apply, what do I need? What do I need in order to apply for my VSP? All right, so let's see. This is a PDF. Yeah, that's nice. That's the first time using this, apparently. Okay. Uh, so for a shop to do this right, commercial general liability insurance up to a million dollars aggregate. $500,000 per event, valid U.S. or Canadian driver's license, proof of business in good standing uh, from your Secretary of State, business card, locksmith's license if required in your state, uh, and additional items, U.S. federal employer ID, uh, Canadian's business number, insurance agent name, two professional references that are not family, terms and conditions, et cetera. So once you have it all ready, you can go and start your application and uh, they'll let you know. Uh, if you have a shop and you want to add sub accounts with it as a subordinate application as well. Uh, so bonding. So business must carry a minimum of $100,000 employee dishonesty or surety bond for registered sub accounts. Need their driver's license, locksmith's license if required, proof of employment. Um, and uh, subordinate accounts are created by the primary account holders. So the primary account holder has to have an account first. So you can go to their website and you can, you can look at all the stuff anyways, download all the stuff. So that's what's required. And then there's also a uh, two-factor authentication app that they use. You can look through that. If someone's abusing it, you can report them. And then uh, Automaker website link. So this is very handy. Um, if I can go in here, and I'm just gonna download that from my desktop, I guess. Uh, yes, sure. Okay. So you can download it to your computer and it's actually a spreadsheet. And it's gonna open on a different window. There we go. All right. So on the spreadsheet, it has a list of all the manufacturers that they have stuff on. So uh, Acura, Audi. Uh, so like, yeah, so like Audi, you can. Uh, BMW, it says we don't send this out. That link's actually broken. Uh, let's see. So yeah, I saw another one from Mercedes, too. So Mercedes just redirects you back to the NASTF site because they don't have anything. Uh, theft rel uh, there's a link to SCR with theft relevant parts. Orders can be completed using a, a form. Uh, otherwise, it was sending you to the dealer. Same with Sprinter. Uh, so like example for uh, Subaru, right? So if I want to go and program a Subaru, me being a Subaru guy, uh, come over here and paste that in there. All right, so if I'm an authorized security professional, I can go in here. And then it's going to ask you what you want, your VIN, your security professional name, and then your LSID or vehicle security pre professional ID, right? So that's, once again, you have to log in with that. Um, let's pop back over to here. Uh, another one that's a good example is, uh, let's see, let's try Nissan. Let's see if this one works. I don't remember if it does. Oops. What are we doing? What are we doing? Nissan service information, accept the thing. So you need to have an account, you have a uh, username and password, and then in your user account, you're gonna have to do that. So this is actually, uh, you have to log, create a free account, log in, then enter your credentials there. So that's not the best example. Let's go with, I know Toyota is. So like I said, you can get all this stuff free off the NASTF website. So uh, if you wanna do your own research a little bit later, this is something you're looking to do. Uh, here's a key code check, right? So right first box, what's your LSID number? So you need to have that ID number and the passcode and a VIN in order to do it, right? So on these newer vehicles, in order to do it the correct way, that's the type of information you need. Now, let me just pop in here real quick as well. I know I'm pretty running, running kind of 
low on time here. But if I pull up, let's pull up my vehicle here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Jeez, I didn't look it up that long ago. Oh, it's up here, right? Well, maybe I looked it up on Shopkey itself. All right, never mind. Shopkey. So there's a good bulletin about this from Subaru. There's a lot of manufacturers that'll publish the uh, these bulletins about this stuff. So if I want to do like a immobilizer ignition key. So there's a TSB on this and replacement key and immobilizer information. So this will give you information in this case, all the way back to 2000 on this, but um, key blank types, the different keys so you can identify them. Goes all the way back to, like I said, 2000. Goes all the way up to the fancy fobs. Uh, tells you when the vehicles started being equipped with it. Website access for security professionals. Um, so you need to go to uh, that, that website with the SDRM step-by-step. Uh, step. Let's see, I'm gonna charge you 10 bucks per transaction, by the way. So it's uh, $9.95 per key code. So you got to make sure you want it. Um, I will also tell you on Subarus, if you're lucky, the, the uh, customer may still have the tag that came with the key. Because uh, it didn't have a six-digit code you had to punch in. But if you have the key, you can do that. Uh, also a teaching code. So that's like a pin code to get into the vehicle. So depending on the model and the year, there's a couple different things as well. Um, so um, let's see. And then, then it talks about laser cutting and things like that. So there's a lot of the information not necessarily related to that. Um, but if you're cutting keys, well, that's that's a place to go. Uh, so multiple manufacturers are that way. And like I said, I think I can show you on the Challenger. One more thing. So I think I, I think I got there today. Let me just double check. Actually, I was looking up on like a 22 Silverado. You can still go in there too, but um, depends on the vehicle, depends on the manufacturer, depends on how they release their, their stuff. But some GMs I've been seeing still have a 30 minute um, keep learning on a couple of them, they say. All right. So, uh, like I said, in this vehicle, the way to get in there is going to be the radio frequency hub. And I'm just going to pick one. They're all pretty much the same. Miscellaneous functions. I can uh, erase, program, replace the uh, radio frequency hub itself. I think if I go into a, a race, it lets me get there. Let's see. Yeah. So there's where you put your pin in. All right. So the pin for the vehicle, remember how I said there was a uh, box for that? Uh, so you can just hit edit and you can type in the pin, whatever it happens to be, and then hit continue. And it would allow you to continue on through there. And I don't. Uh, hey, look, it's the right pin for this vehicle. Uh, entering entering the incorrect pin three times, by the way, will lock you out. Uh, so just hit yes. Validates the pin. It's going to give me an error message because I'm not um, I'm not hooked up to an actual car. So that's as far as I can go. Uh, but that would be the, like a dialog box where you can plug in your pin as well. So it's just a few examples. Like I said, it's not an exhaustive list. Most man every manufacturer is a little bit different. Um, so just like I said, read up on what the manufacturer is telling you that they need you to do, um, to do it the right way, the legal way, uh, you know, some hoops you have to drum through, but once you've done that, you know, it, 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 after that, you have your number, you have your ID numbers. You can just log in after that. And then just, you know, pass the, pass the savings along to the customer every time you need a key code. Uh, so hopefully we picked up some tips and tricks there. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot, um, and like I said, it's by by far not a comprehensive list of things that uh, manufacturers do. So kind of they all work very similarly. It's just how they go to program them. And like, so let's talk about next week. Next week is class number five out of our five new classes that we're doing, and it will be on power user functions part two. So we did a power user functions a couple of years ago on different ways to get more out of your scan tool than you might be uh, used to using. There might be some hidden hidden gems in there that you might not even know. Um, so you can go in and you can check that out. Same time, same place, 6 and 9 Eastern, snapon.com slash OT. If you want to join me on Zoom. Otherwise, the 6 Eastern goes to YouTube like we're doing right now, youtube.com slash snapondiagnostics. 
Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe. It helps us out with the, uh, you know, the, all the al algorithms and stuff. And uh, make sure you ring the bell, give it a like, all those other good things. The 9 p.m. Eastern class also goes to my YouTube, uh, Facebook channel. So facebook.com slash snap on Jason. If you want to give me a follow there, it's all one word, no dash in the snap on. Um, same time, same place. You'll see me next week. If you want to see any of the past prior topics we've covered in this series, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, things like ADOS data bus testing. Uh, we did a whole component testing over a couple summers ago. VVT, hybrids, electric vehicles, forced induction. All of these things are available and um, readily available for you, nice and free. And there's a playlist for it for uh, live training. So check that out if you want. Okay, let's get to questions. I uh, noticed that a lot of you joined late on Zoom. So if you do have questions and you weren't here for the beginning, just plug it in the Q&A box. You should see a little button at the top or bottom of your screen. Plug it in the Q&A. I see the uh, YouTube chat is quite lively tonight. So we'll get through those in a second. Before I do, I do want to mention my buddy, Al. So Al also does free training. And he does training on scan tool specific training. So Monday is on Apollo. Wednesday is on Zeus and Thursday is on Triton. So the first hour, any of these classes, they're going to be on their respective tool. And it's kind of designed to have the tool in front of you and follow along with what he's doing on the screen. So that way you get that the hands-on function of that. Um, but first hour is going to be, let's make sure your Wi-Fi is hooked up and show you how to do that. Let's set you up with your free Snap on Cloud account. We'll touch on Security Link, AutoAuth. Here's where to plug in all the information on the different websites you need to use. And then he goes through code to completion on a real world example using uh, fast track intelligent diagnostic. Um, so that's the first hour. On Wednesday and Thursday, since those tools have scopes and meters, he takes about a five minute break, takes another hour talking about scope, meter, got a component test, graphing multimeter, all sorts of different things on those tools. Uh, it's definitely worth your time. Al's been with us over 33 years and he's a wealth of snap on tool knowledge. Now, I will tell you, uh, within the next couple of weeks, we will be changing this slightly. The schedule might change a little bit. And we're actually going to combine the Apollo and Triton class on Thursday, just so you know. Uh, because the Apollo and the Triton, the scanner function is the same. Uh, it's just the Triton adds on the additional scope functions. So um, it's just going to be on Wednesday and Thursday nights and uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so make sure you check that out if you're interested. All right, let's get to questions, comments, what we have. All right, so we go way back to the beginning. So I am Smiley from Vancouver Island. Thanks for checking in. Uh, Quinn, welcome. I know I kind of mentioned you already, but welcome. Thanks for joining us as always. 86 as a rate. Hello. Uh, Mario Rodriguez, say, yeah, it's cooler in Dallas, Texas. It might even be cooler in Dallas, Texas right now than it is at my house in Connecticut. So could be. Uh, Quinn's reminiscing on the uh, VAT system, GMs 1 through 15, with the pellet embedded in the keyblade. Yeah, I remember the way, way, way back. I had a car with that, and it, had, it was just a regular GM key, and it had the little pellet on there. It's RFID pellet. Uh, Nick, welcome back from London, England. Uh, you are always a trooper at 11 o'clock at night checking this out, so I appreciate it. Uh, Quinn also asked, what Snap-on scan tools had or have this capability? So I think he's talking about key programming. Also, besides the keys being drastically changed to be able to program, uh, were the fobs affected? So it's going to depend on the manufacturer. As we saw, you're kind of, as I was a little early on in the presentation, but every manufacturer's got a little bit different. Some manufacturers, if it's easy enough to integrate it with the scan tool, we do. Other manufacturers, if they make it you know, exceedingly difficult, like you have to actually log into their website on the tool in order to do it or something like that, it's not going to work. Um, if it's just a pin code, oftentimes you can just plug in the pin code and it works, uh, or key codes, things like that. It's just, you need that extra information, which is where the confusion and where the problems lie. Uh, Phil says he can't find anything in Mitchell. All that is where it's at. Well, that's your opinion. Um, I've been able to, I've actually had, had a couple of stories pretty recently where, uh, the wrong information was in all data and, uh, they couldn't program an ADOS function. So I guess it just kind of depends on what you're looking at. Uh, and then Quinn asked if we cover, if we cover domestic and Asian, anything European. And like I said, they're not really wanting to give up that information, BMW and Mercedes. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Phil also says, uh, why are we talking about key programming with snap on scanners? Can't do it. Well, I think we talked through that and we found out that snap on scanners can do actually quite a bit 
of them, you may just need some more information from the manufacturer in order to make it happen. Uh, let's see. Yep, jump the gun. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So Phil also asked SDRMs what we need to do to be able to get the pin codes. Yes. So if you need the pin code from the manufacturer, like I said, they will offer it up as long as you go through jump all those hoops and everything. Um, they'll allow you to go in and access the information that you may need. Uh, let's see. Uh, Quinn says, quite the coincidence that this week's video is on a mobilizer. My wife's Mercedes is in the driveway dead because the immobilizer is inoperative. Uh, not the locking part for the electronic component. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah, Phil, I think we covered that too. So LLC to register. So business documentation in order to register that way. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. can jump across the starter relay, but that's not going to work. So yeah, that's the, uh, it'll, it might start, but it's not going to run. Uh, let's see. Another question from Phil off topic, but uh, why does Snap-on still zoom out on the oscilloscope and not zoom in? You know, I've been asking for that for a while to be able to just kind of draw a picture on the screen and zoom in. Um, not sure why they still do it that way, um, but that's the way they do it. So the, the key point on that is to make sure you record at a much shorter time base, you know, microseconds, low milliseconds, and then zoom out and then you can be able to uh, get around it that way. Um, I'm Smiley agrees with that and uh, I hear you. And then we got some chatting between some other products. Uh, da, 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 da. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Raymond, thank you for checking in. Uh, and the, I am Smiley says, yep, another cash grab, $10 a key code. Yep, that's manufacturer. Uh, let's see. And uh, Nick asks, does the Zeus Plus come with a tool bag like Snap on Zeus? Yes, it is a different bag. It is uh, much more similar to the. Uh, the way the Triton is kind of folds in half. Um, and then uh, Phil H is going to says, is Snap-on going to make a pin cold puller? I'm going to go with no. And the reason for that is, is that is a very skirting into not legal. And we have many legal contracts agreements with manufacturers. And I know we wouldn't want to put those in jeopardy. So I'm going to say, no, I don't think we're going to do that. Good question. Though. Good question. All right, like I said, very active tonight, so it's always appreciated. Uh, with that, let's go there. There we go. Uh, thank you very much for taking a little bit of time out of your busy day to spend a little bit of time with me. Hopefully, we learned a little bit more about the uh, intricacies of immobilizer systems and key programming and secure data release model and all those things. And you see, it's not necessarily as simple as it used to be. Um, you still have the capabilities of doing it on many vehicles. It's just you might need that extra information like PIN codes, key codes, things of that nature. Uh, so with that, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Hopefully we'll see you next week for Power User Functions Part 2. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night and take care.